My name is Deb Keener and I'm the executive director and founder of the Potter's Hands Foundation. Um, this all started for me back in 2012. My daughter-in-law went to India on a missions trip. She was working with women who had been sex trafficked in India and came back to the U.S. and started talking to me about it and it literally just broke my heart. I um, began researching the topic and discovered that it was happening in the U.S. way more than I had any idea. So as she started talking to me, I really thought I was supposed to do something with um, women who had been sex trafficked. I wanted to talk to somebody because I didn't think that my small town, um, my community really had a problem with it. So I wanted to talk to somebody who knew something about it. And so I met with a woman, her name was Elizabeth Files, and she was the director of the Human Trafficking Task Force for Western New York. And I remember sitting in a restaurant with her and her husband and I said, you know, I know it goes on in this country, but I'm guessing it happens in big cities, not small towns like mine. And she just kind of looked at me and she goes, actually it happens in every small town, every big city across the country. It just depends on where you are, what it looks like. After I met with Elizabeth, I was like, okay, I know I'm supposed to open up a safe house for these women, but I felt a little bit like Noah <laughs> building the ark because nobody knew that there was a problem with it. Um, just like I didn't know that there was a problem with it. And after that, I uh, just really felt like we needed to get organized with our what we were doing. And so we formed our board of directors. We wrote our 501c3 application, got that approved in July of 2014. So I started kind of continued researching, building the organization, recruiting volunteers, but I had this list on my computer, I call it the action list. <laughs> and it was really names, ideas, um, people that I felt like I needed to talk to. And I knew that there was a guy from our community who was a Christian man, and I knew he was a builder, and I knew that he had a really good reputation. So I put his name on my list, had no intention of building a home. We thought that we were going to buy an old farmhouse, fix it up, and use that space. Six months after I wrote his name on my list, somebody offered us five acres of land. I still thought we weren't gonna build a house. <laughs> I was like, we'll take the girls camping, you know, it'll be a nice place to get away. And so I didn't even come look at it. Six months after that, so a year after I wrote that man's name on my list, I finally came to see the property. And as soon as my husband and I got out of the car, it was like, this is it. This is where we're supposed to be. And so that night, we were supposed to go to the movies and I said, sorry, I can't go. I have to call this builder that I wrote on my list a year ago. We met that week. I shared my vision. I told him that I really felt like this home was supposed to be beautiful and that the women who would come here would know that they were priceless and that God loved them and cared for them in a very deep way. And he said at the end of our meeting that he wanted to build the house for us without charging us anything for his time which would have been about $150,000 um, that he donated. And so he designed our home. Typically it takes him, uh, I think he said four months to get everything sketched and a design in place. And we told him that we'd be praying for him. It took him four hours to design our home to scale. And we haven't changed anything from that original design. After that, you know, we continued to just move forward, um, started raising money. And I remember thinking, Lord, I have no clue how to raise a million dollars. And the name Rahab's Rebels just popped into my head with the idea to ask some friends if they would be willing to help raise money and set a $5,000 or a $10,000 goal. It was around 2013 that um, Deb Keener had um, put something on Facebook that they were starting this and with the uh, organization was you know coming into being and I thought to myself you know that sounds like something I might like to get involved in and so I actually sent her a message and just said I'd love to hear more about it I felt God was calling me to be involved in the ministry and um, so I have been pretty much since then um, been first with the Rahab Rebels um, which is an awesome group of women and Currently, I'm the manager of Heavenly Treats, wholly owned subsidiary of, of Potter's Dance Foundation. And the purpose of that is to raise revenue for the Potter's Dance. My name is Lynn Hayes, and I'm a Rahab's Rebel volunteer with the fundraising aspect of the Potter's Dance Foundation. A friend from church asked me to come to a meeting a few summers ago, and I was curious because she would share about the Potter's Hands fundraisers and 
I hadn't heard much about it before then. Um, but then after the first meeting, it was, wow, God's going to do amazing things, and I want to be on, on that uh, journey. I knew about the ministry and its development, but I didn't know for several years <laughs> that I would have a direct involvement. Trafficking, exploitation, happens right here in our small community. Sometimes it starts with a person who's vulnerable because they are already addicted, seeking stability. Stability can look like believing a person who says that he or she will provide for and take care of them and give them a place to stay and make sure that they have food to eat and money in their pocket. And when you are unstable, and someone offers you stability, it is a very reasonable thing to accept that. And it is also reasonable for us to learn that for some women, they then find themselves trapped in a situation that they don't know how to get out of. So the house is a 9,000 square foot home with 10 bedrooms and eight bathrooms. We have um, this awesome casual space behind me just for, uh, just hanging out, classes that we do, beautiful fireplace um, that's going quite often because one of our residents loves to make the fires. We have a grand piano that was donated um, so that we can do music lessons and for those who already know how to play, they can play. We have a separate counseling room in the house. We also have in our basement just kind of a big rec room area. Uh, it's kind of a multi-purpose area, so we have two huge sectional sofas and a large screen TV. Last night we were able to do a movie night and just kind of all piled on the couches and had popcorn. We have workout equipment. The girls can exercise. We actually have that as part of our requirement for the program so that they're physically healthy. We have a state-of-the-art kitchen. It's a beautiful kitchen. There were so many people that had a part in donating. This chandelier that is hanging in the center of our home is a work of art. The fireplace area, as well as our dining room table and the chandelier over the dining room table was crafted by the builder of our home and he truly is an artist. So as far as the space goes, it couldn't be any more beautiful. The program is designed to be a year-long program, really focusing in on the counseling and the trauma that these women have been through. I love to walk you through a typical day of our program. Day starts with the daytime staff arriving in the morning and the nighttime staff and over, overnight volunteer um, would be ready to head out for the day. And then we start into a time of devotion. Anyone who's here in the house gathers in a central place and we spend uh, 15 minutes or so reflecting. It's never the same one day to the next in our devotion time. Um, the thing that is the same is that we continue to bring that devotion time back to the one who brought us all here. When we dismiss from devotions, we have uh, from 9 until noon what we call program time. And program time could look like a class that has a facilitator uh, where there would have been preparation work done, some homework, some writing, and then group sharing about the material. It could look like pieces of case management um, where we would have been working on legal issues because most people come with legal issues, financial issues that they brought with them. Working on all of the case management pieces to help to um, keep everyone moving forward in all of their areas of recovery. I'm a dance fitness instructor and God laid it upon my heart a few years ago to share that. It's a community-based dance fitness program that we can infuse Christian music, positive lyrics, affirmation, worthiness, purity, loveliness, in God's eyes. He opened the door for me to come here when the house opened, and we enjoy time together once a week with uh, dance fitness. We don't just come to dance to the music, but we have relationship with each other, and each week we get to know each other a little bit better, and the, just the camaraderie community aspect that we're all just here encouraging each other. By noontime, we're all ready for lunch, and we head to the kitchen, and it's make your own. Um, some people like to plan out their meal schedule because they like to work on nutrition. 
We want to connect people to better nutritional information, think about what you're eating, and take the time to plan it. And then from one to four, again in the afternoon, it's program time. Sometimes there's a group of volunteers from Heavenly Treats here working in the kitchen. The management of the Heavenly Treats, which was gifted to the potter's hands, has been challenging, <laughs> to say the least, but we actually started it as an LLC um, and did it in pretty rapid time. And so now we, th this kitchen here at the house is a commercial kitchen and we make all the product here. So I have a team of volunteers that come in and help package the fudge. Um, and it's a fun time. Uh, everybody's just, you know, talking. You know, women, when we get together, we, we like to talk. And it's just a fun thing to do. And uh, I'm grateful because the whole thing is done with volunteers. No one is a paid, paid person to run this business. I think as the volunteers, as we're working and having a good time, I believe that's really an example. Um, to the residents here, that they can see that what our life can, you know, life can be like and what their future can be. By four o'clock, that day would have modeled a work day for someone in the traditional workforce. That's why we like to have our program time take place during the day. Um, some of the residents who came here were used to working 24 hours a day, any hour of the day or night. And so teaching your body clock to respond to more of the a business environment or a workplace environment workday um, is something that is helpful. One of our residents is assigned to dinner duty and so she would have planned the menu for the week. She'll start preparing. She may have help or she may prefer to cook alone and she'll work on a family style meal for dinner. So we do all gather and eat that meal at one time. After dinner there's chore time because this is a home that has personal spaces like bedrooms and bathrooms that need to be cleaned and there are common spaces and there's a lot of wood floor. After chores it's free time and free time for residents looks like watching television, playing games, uh, we've got craft supplies and a craft table, um, doing activities that are an escape. Um, it's important that there be that kind of free time in the evening and we try to keep it free of commitments. Um, there are a few exceptions. We do take residents to weekly um, support group to support their sober life. It's important to connect in lots of different ways, both in the home and out of the home. Saturdays and Sundays look different. We plan outings. We do uh, attend a local church. It's a short time out of the house, and uh, once we're back on Sundays, it's Sunday dinner and um, more free time. This is a letter that was written by one of our residents to her father. Dear Dad, I drew these for you. Nothing is traced. I love and miss you. I especially miss the kids. You don't need to worry anymore. I'm safe. This was the right move for me. I needed to learn how to stand on my own two feet. It would have never worked with someone controlling everything. Luckily, this is just the place you go to when you come from a toxic situation like the one I was in. The no contact thing isn't a punishment or because we've done something wrong. It's so we focus on ourselves and so the toxic people don't find us. They help you explore so many different things. I literally live in a mansion in the middle of the woods upstate. When I say mansion, I mean it. It's brand new and gorgeous. It has a trail, we're surrounded by trees and wildlife, right next to a creek with running water. There's a pond with bass in it. Best of all, the quietness. The peace and the nature and the difference in oxygen due to all the trees. We have a big fireplace and burn wood from the backyard. It always smells amazing. I take walks through the woods and I draw. Here are some of my drawings. I also write. We cook and do chores. It's the perfect household and not chaotic. We have classes and read the Bible and become closer to God. They counsel us and help us with our self-esteem. We also have treadmills and work out and do a dance fit class. I have my own bedroom with a big window overlooking the woods and the hills, all the trees. I even have my own bathroom and tub and it's gorgeous. They made my bed really comfy with soft blankets. They put a lot of love into this house. 
the house is new, huge, and breathtaking. Unlike most houses, it's unique and was built on donated land, all by people who care. Tell the kids I love them. I also don't mind having no social media. I thought I'd hate it at first, but this is truly a cleanse. I love you guys so much. One of our residents recently said we were sitting here and it was snowing outside. And she said, I feel like we live in a snow globe. You know, and to me that has so much significance, not just because, you know, when you pick one of those things up and you hold it and you look at it and you dream about that perfect life that is inside that globe, not to say this is a perfect life, but the safety that you feel when you look at that, that just spoke volumes to me um, when she made that comment because I felt like if that's what she's feeling right now, then this is awesome. We've done something right. Well, I love these girls, you know, when they come and it's so, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. They come with so much, so much trauma. Um, it's, it's really unimaginable, the things that they've been through. You know, when you hear their stories, you, you think, wow, how is that even possible that you're still here? And when they come in, our goal for the first few weeks is just to, to make them feel safe and, and to know that they're loved because so many of them come not knowing that they have anyone in the world that cares about them. And so our goal is to help them know that they are loved. In addition to that, our goal is to continue to be a mentor to them. We don't want to cut the relationship off once they leave the program because for a lot of them, we are the family that they now have. And I think that's the story of this place is that when you walk through these doors, you know that you are loved, period. Doesn't matter what you've been through, doesn't matter where you're at that day. We just want you to know that you're loved, you're accepted for who you are, and we're gonna help you become the best that you can be. And so that's what excites me when I see them starting to dream a little bit and think about their future and leave the past behind. Um, that's our goal. The impact on my heart is just seeing God do amazing things. And you know, just even seeing this beautiful house for the first time, uh, driving up the driveway, just the, the tears of joy, of happiness, seeing what, what God, God built for the purpose of, of these young women and the impact on, on the community. It's, I think it's drawing churches together. You know, it doesn't matter denomination anymore. We're all in God's family, um, building his kingdom, sharing it with these young women that are, that are finding us, that, that God is directing them here. And so the impact is, you know, the ripple effect, it's gonna continue to grow even bigger. I just, I feel very committed, you know, to, to this ministry and I'd like to see other people become that committed that they would even just respond if it's five, ten dollars a month, but you're making a commitment to the ministry and supporting it, even if you don't have the time to do it, that you can do it financially. There are a lot of ways that people can get involved in this ministry, um, you know, we talked about our overnight volunteers and our Rebels team. Um, Facilities is another area people can get involved, but also mentoring women, um, providing job opportunities for the women when they graduate. Um, if you're someone who wants to get involved, it's, it's really simple. You go on our website and you send us an email and say, I'd like to volunteer, I'd like to get involved with the work that you're doing. One of the things that we love about what we do is that we get to be a local place for people to get their hands dirty. You know, they can come in, they can walk alongside these women, and mentor them. They can be an overnight staff member. They can teach a cooking class. They can come in and teach an art class. They can teach somebody how to play this beautiful grand piano that we have. Um, there's so many things. I always tell people, if you have an interest in being a part of what we're doing, talk to me and we'll find a place for you to fit. The number one thing is to pray. Um, that's the most important thing is to pray. They have challenges here. And pray for the finances and pray that we're making an impact and that the right people come along at the right time. Um, it's just so many issues that they can pray for. When someone has a passion for any one thing, they can turn that into a profit for our ministry. The regular committed financial donor, that amount that someone can donate monthly to support the ministry, is critical. The Potter's Hands Foundation is a 501c3. We are not for profit. We also 
do not use state or federal funds to operate our program. This ministry operates in God's economy, and time and time again, we have seen that God has a way of providing for this ministry in ways we could never plan for or anticipate. This letter is written by one of our residents to a potential resident to the house. I am two states away from my youngest and many states away from my oldest. Both are girls and my kids are worth the effort I put in being here at the Potter's Hand Safe House. The house is awesome. You will love it here. I know from experience how hard it is to uproot from loved ones, drugs, and friends. But those who love you will be here for you as you get this awesome chance to reform your life and shape it into what you deserve. You are worth it. I've been here for almost two months, been clean from heroin, crack, and meth for one year. It can be done. I was scared also to clean up and get into a program, but here I am. I'm going to be going to school, and that's amazing. I'm really glad I got a chance to write you. Change can be scary, been an addict ever since I was 12 years old. Now I am clean and on my way to being something in life. It can and will happen. Come try it out. Those who love you will be waiting for the new you.